Welcome back to Motlow College Public Speaking. This is Emily Seal. Today we're in Chapter 3 on page 28. If you haven't already, please go and watch that TED video. The, the picture here um, is the opener, so you should, should look familiar to you if you've watched it. Um, so, story time. I had a wart on my foot. Gross, I know. Uh, and I went into a drugstore and I see an entire shelf of medicines. And I think, okay, I can handle this. I can get rid of this wart. There's an entire shelf of medicines. Uh, there are these little um, burner kits where you can freeze your wart off. There are these um, pads where you can put the medicine on it and then cover it with a pad. Uh, I tried home remedies, apple cider vinegar, duct tape, uh, supplements, uh, you know, desiccated liver supplements, all pretty gross stuff, and none of it really worked. There was a shelf full of medicine, and they kind of helped, and the wart would go away for a little while, and then it would come back, and none of it 100% worked. And if we had uh, one product that completely got rid of warts altogether, we wouldn't have to suck the shelves with 20 different medicines. And here's my point. I'm going to talk to you today about nervousness. If I had a magic pill that got rid of your nervousness, I would be a rich lady. I would not struggle with nervousness and anxiety so much myself, right? Um, but hopefully today I'll give you some medicines and they'll soothe you and they'll help you at times. But just know that you have to have courage to speak publicly. And at the end of the day, there's nothing that I can do about that. You have to be courageous. You have to be willing to make yourself vulnerable. You have to be willing to put yourself out there. And it comes down to a test of character. And um, some of you will struggle and wrestle, as I have, with anxiety and nervousness. And others of you, it won't really bother you, and you'll be fine. And um, I covet your position, <laughs> personally, because while I think that public speaking is important and I know that um, I ought to be giving speeches I still get nervous and so as when I'm speaking to you today it's not necessarily as someone who has mastery over their fear as someone who has been in the trenches with you and uh, this is advice that I follow myself so I hope that it is useful to you and that um, any frustration that I've had throughout the years uh, you can you don't have to go through it because I've given you some tips and some ways to overcome anxiety. So, um, let's uh, jump in. On, on page 28, they do sort of say what I just said in that some people struggle more with anxiety uh, than others. It has to do with your personality, your um, adrenalines, your fight or flight system. Uh, all of these things are individualized to different people. So if you have a high percentage of anxiety, um, like you've been to a counselor and you've had medication and you can get a note from your doctor saying that your anxiety is off the charts, um, then there, there are things that we can do to make this class um, easier for you. Come see me in my office and we can work together on that. Um, but let's talk about how to manage your nervousness. We bemoaned the fact that the nervousness is real. <laughs> it's real, real, y'all. Um, so let's move into how to manage it. So one of the first things that you can do is know how does it affect you, right? Nervousness is really just an, an adrenal adrenaline. Uh, if you're at the top of page 30, you can see what James Belesco says. It's a wonderful stimulant. It makes you sharper. Maybe you've seen the video of a woman picking up a car because her child has been crushed underneath it, right? That sense of adrenaline giving you superpowers is true. Um, however, that surge of adrenaline can feel a lot like water coming out of a fire hydrant, right? It's an it's overkill. We don't need that much water. We just need a sip of water. We don't need a blast of water blowing us away. So what you have to learn to do is start to sort of uh, manage your trickle, right? Manage, um, learn where the cues and the knobs are and how to uh, get the right amount of nervous energy going and keep it under control rather than uh, letting it uh, overtake you or knock you over. 
So he talks very practically about what are some things that you can do. Okay, if I am a person whose hand shakes, maybe I don't hold a piece of paper in my hand because I know that that paper is going to shake. Maybe you have breathlessness. Your voice feels thin and you can't breathe when you get nervous. Well, if you know that, take some nice, slow breaths, right? Get your breath, as we say uh, in the business, underneath you. Get your breath underneath you. Center yourself, right? And take some deep breaths before you try to get up and give a speech. So, uh, know specifically how you react to stress. And then, uh, like I said, make sure that you're taking precautions against it. Maybe you know that you feel a little bit lightheaded when you give a speech. That might mean that you need to stand behind the podium. I generally don't like for my students to stand behind the podium. It can feel a bit formal and our classroom is so small. Um, But if you're a person who feels weak-kneed and lightheaded when you give a speech, by all means, grab both sides of that podium and hold on. (laughs) And uh, that will help you, hopefully, to feel a little more stable. Um, If you are a person uh, with... um, even a disability. Maybe you need to sit down. Maybe that's, uh, maybe uh, you are at risk of having a seizure and one of the things that's making you super nervous is that you're going to have a seizure. And even though that may not be um, logical, if sitting down helps you to feel more safe and secure, then um, the the chair is high. It's not a, you know, you're going to be sitting up higher than everybody else. So talk to me if you, especially if you have disabilities, about how we can make sure that you feel like you're on um, an even playing field. You have every advantage that I can help you with. Here's a human reaction uh, to control it right? Maybe you uh, feel your knees start to shake. A temptation you might have is to lock your knees and stiffen them up. Um, And then you lean back and then what happens if you lock your knees is you can actually faint, right? So trying to control your symptoms, trying to fix them, um, can sometimes cause more Um, pain than not. So for example, um, if you start to feel some tension in your throat and you start to stretch your throat out and lock your throat and I can see all of these um, things in your, in your, uh, on the outside of your throat because you're trying to tense up and fix it. That's causing, that tension is causing more hurt um, than, than help. What I'm going to encourage you to do to a certain extent is ride the wave. You start to feel your knees shaking, acknowledge it with your mind. Okay, my knees are shaking. This is what happens when I get nervous. It's not the end of the world. My knees are going to shake. Let them shake. I start to feel a little bit of tension in my throat. Take a deep swallow. Take a deep breath. Acknowledge, you know. You start to feel your shoulders creeping up like they talked about in the video. Drop your shoulders back and just be aware. Okay, that's what's going on in my body right now. And it's okay. Whatever your body is doing, um, these are natural um, reactions to stress. They're not necessarily the best reactions to stress, but they happen. And you just got to go with it right? You just got to go with it. Try to avoid locking up and controlling and uh, letting the tension make you stiff. Try instead to breathe and yawn and stretch and, you know, take those languid gestures to sort of counteract the stiffness. Stiffness is what we want to avoid. I already mentioned this. Nervousness is energy you can channel. It's, um, It is uh, eustress if you use it correctly, not distress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, energy that empowers and enlightens and your eyes will light up and your body might feel electric, but we react to that energy right? That energy that you share with us. Uh, It's a stimulation that is meaningful. So um, just because your body feels different from how it does when you're relaxed doesn't make it a bad thing. Um, not to be crass, uh, but there's a very famous public speaking instructor who's, who talks about you know, how naturally your body prepares you for lots of things. And one of those um, being sexual encounters. 
right? Your body feels different before sexual encounter, but that doesn't mean bad different. It's the same with uh, giving a speech or getting scared when you're about to do something courageous. Your body feels different, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. So, um, and as much as you can, soothe your body, try to relax your body, but know that it knows what it's doing. And that energy is going to cost you a little something in the terms of your comfort, but it's going to take you a long way in the terms of um, your level of engagement with us. So what are some ways that you can soothe uh, physically soothe your body. Well, they talked about this in the video that you watched, uh, your hypothalamus and all that. Think about breathing deep into your groin. I know that doesn't logically make sense. Some of you nursing majors are going, what? Uh, but it's a term that we use in yoga, breathing deep into your groin, right? Um, this stretch right here is a very useful one. Um, you get your blood flowing and uh, you get rid of some of that tension and stretching is just does wonders. Now you want to do all this before you give your speech, right? Uh, it may mean that you stretch as you're walking in from your car. It may mean that you go to the bathroom in the handicap stall and stretch. I've definitely done that before if I start to feel some tension coming in. It may mean that I'm doing sun salutations in my office. It wouldn't be the first time. So exercise, 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 right? Um, you know, you, it may just mean that you can walk around the building real fast before you come in. If you're a, a runner and that's something that you do regularly, um, I highly recommend that you run the days that you give a speech. A little bit of tiredness will actually go farther as far as your honesty and your body relaxation. So, um, you know, do your yoga, do your running, do your workout routine if you have one, and that will help with your um, physical readiness to give a speech. Deep breaths. Deep breaths. This is something you can do as you walk up to the podium to give your speech. Breathe in through your nose. Sometimes I like to take a deep five second breath through my nose, hold it for five seconds, and then take a deep five second uh, breath out. That uh, sense of rhythm and that sense of um, getting enough oxygen to your brain that's very soothing for me now once again this is a very individualistic thing it might be that you take deep breaths and you feel like you're drowning and you're hyperventilating and that doesn't work for you statistically it works for most people deep breathing however I understand um, that everybody is different and only do what works for you hug somebody right uh, truly those endorphins will go uh, get going if you have skin to skin contact um, you never need to go into a speech asking your audience uh, to make you less lonely right and skin to skin contact is a proven way to relax you right pat somebody in the back when you come into class uh, you know come and give somebody a side hug before you uh, have to give a speech that day. It will soothe you and it will soothe them. Some other ways that you can think of skin to skin if you're a shy person you don't feel like necessarily hugging on other people. Um, I understand that. You can um, pop your own knuckles. You can run your fingers through your hair. Um, you can put your hand on your heart and feel your heart beating. Um, you can wring your hands. I know that um, the sense of, uh, you may not know what the term wring your hands means, um, rubbing your palms together and, and feeling the skin against the skin. Um, once again, these uh, fidgets I don't want to see while you're giving your speech. I don't want you to be standing up there popping your neck, knuckles and playing with your hair while you're giving your speech because that's distracting. But if you're doing it before your speech, those natural fidgety, self-soothing uh methods are instinctual and good. So just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Uh, if you feel like you're bombing, if you feel like this is the worst speech in the world, um, just know that things usually look worse from the inside than from the outside. 
keep plowing through it. I can't tell you how many people have stopped in the middle of the speech and said, Miss Hill, can I give and give this next class? And everyone is just astounded. They, you were doing great. What are you talking about? It was fine. Um, so d just keep swimming if you can. Um, so we're going to move into, we're moving out of the body and moving more into the intellectual game of giving a speech. What's going on in your brain? How is um, your self-talk? How are you talking to yourself? And um, one of the first things that I will tell you in the struggle of the mind as you're giving a speech is to believe in what you're saying. This is one of the reasons why picking your topic is so important because if you feel passionate about what you're speaking about, you can make it less about your own insecurities and more about the message that you're sending out. If you're too busy saying to have something in my teeth, is my fly unzipped? Uh, well, first of all, make sure you go to the bathroom before you give a speech and uh, before class and <laughs> make sure you don't have anything in your teeth and that your fly uh, is in fact not unzipped, right? I would appreciate that. Uh, it will give you a, a sense of peace, but a, an unhealthy level of insecurity where you just can't get rid of this feeling like, oh, uh, my hair looks bad today, or oh, uh, I'm just not worthy to give this speech. Those sort of thoughts um, can create noise in your brain where you can't focus, right? So try to instead of focusing on yourself, focus on the other. And the other in this situation is your audience, the people sitting in the room across from you. They need to, um, you, you need to be looking at their uh, body language to make sure that they're understanding what you're saying. Look for feedback in them. Focus on the message rather than yourself. Uh, the reason I have Mother Teresa there is because she has said some pretty bold things as a woman and as a person of conviction. Uh, and uh, she's definitely a model for someone who can say what's hard to say in front of a group of people. Um, some of you really struggle with a sense of perfectionism. Maybe uh, you have a paper that's due on Friday and you just keep putting it off and you just keep putting it off and it's because you don't know exactly what the right words are to say and you're afraid of putting something on paper that's not exactly right. You got to get away from that, people. You got to put something on the page and let it be good and not perfect. Just start working with it. Um, don't be afraid to jump in just because you want it to be exactly how it ought to be. Uh, you know, this is, once again, I'm always trying to get you to know yourself a little bit better. And if you're a perfectionist, I just want to challenge you to start to let go of that. It's not about being perfect. It's not about sounding absolutely correct. It's about what goes on. It, it's not about what goes on in a computer. It's about what goes on in your heart and what goes on in your head. Dave Grohl saying, um, he actually was accepting an award for a song that wasn't digitally remastered and he was just kind of encouraging people um, you know be authentic even if it's not perfect uh, it can still be good even if it uh, even if we hear somebody coughing in the background of your song or or it has some static on it that doesn't mean that it's not still a valuable and useful um, piece of art so what I want you to do is visualize success. On page 33, we're looking at self-talk. Now, I have in your D2L module a uh, outline about self-talk, and uh, it's a tribute to self-talk, actually, um, because I have found it to be a very useful cognitive restructuring. On the bottom of page 33, cognitive restructuring is a strategy for reducing communication anxiety by replacing negative thoughts with statements of positive ones. And what it really boils down to is being kind to yourself. That little voice in your head that um, you know, whether it be your conscience or um, the way that you see the world, your worldview, um, try to let that voice not dwell. We're all going to think mean things about ourselves, but don't sit there. Don't wallow in it. Um, keep moving forward. So uh, an example of a positive self-talk might be, 
Emily, you can do this. You've given speeches a hundred times. You've given this lecture for four years. Um, you know, you are capable. Uh, just do what you rehearsed. The, that's an example of a positive self-talk. Here are some things to put it into perspective. If you bomb on this one speech, so what? Right? There are lots of speeches throughout the semester. There are papers. There are written work. If you do bad on this one speech, maybe you're a person of academic excellence and you're just really nervous you're going to mess up your grade. Well, remember, there's lots of grades in the course. Put it into perspective. Maybe you're worried about making a fool of yourself. Uh, what's, what is the worst possible scenario? Maybe you fall down and hit your head, right? That's what you're, if you're a really anxious person, you might fear silly things like that. Um, but in reality, if you fall down, we'll help you pick up, right? It's going to be okay. If you haven't rehearsed your speech at all, you're going to be way more nervous. Adequate preparation is one of the best ways to overcome anxiety. Make sure that you have done the work. Make sure that you haven't procrastinated and that you have gotten in there and, and you've done the speech for your mom, you've done the speech for your dog, you've done the speech for your boyfriend. All of these people agree it's a great speech. What might actually happen when you get into the room is muscle memory might take over. And that means um, that if you... Okay, if you're a football player and, and your coach had you running a play over and over and over again, he was trying to get it into your muscle memory. Uh, if you were a dancer and you notice uh, after the first couple times of going through this dance, you don't even have to think about it anymore. It's just in your body. That's called muscle memory. Maybe it was you driving here this morning. You didn't have to actually sit and think, which exit do I need to take? Probably you've driven to Motlow enough times now that your muscle memory takes over and you kind of mentally check out. This is, um, can be frustrating for people who um, really want to stay engaged. It's not ideal, but sometimes you'll get up to give your speech and your mind will be somewhere else. And you'll sit back down, you'll come to me after class and you'll say, I wasn't even like, I was like an out-of-body experience <laughs> giving that speech today. And I'll most likely say, we didn't even notice. Your muscle memory took over, you'd done the speech so many times that you went through it just fine. So that just is a testament to the importance of um, practicing your delivery, as it says on page 34. If you've ever had somebody say to you, just imagine the audience naked, <laughs> uh, the basic advice that they're giving you there is to put into perspective who is in the room. You're not giving the speech for the president, you're not giving the speech in this case, at least, um, for your ex-boyfriend or whoever makes you nervous. This is a room full of people who are in the exact same boat as you. They're people who are also giving a speech and they are your cheerleaders. I am your cheerleader. If you do well, I look good, so I want you to do well. So. Um, remember that we are not against you. You don't have an antagonistic. If there is somebody in the class who makes you very uncomfortable for one reason or another, try to avoid eye contact with them. Okay? And that's okay. You don't have to look at every single person in the eye. Some of you, the only comfort will be that this is a temporary thing. This class will be over soon, but even more importantly, this speech will be over today, and then you can go home and have a cookie. It's only part of your grade, I already mentioned that, uh, for you uh, who are academically driven. This is only one portion of your grade. There are lots of assignments. If you do bad on this one speech, you still have um, plenty of opportunities. Another thing to remember is the format in which you're speaking. It's uh, Public speaking is a synchronous communication. So it's just like talking on the phone. You might stumble a little bit. You might say, mm, or huh, or you might struggle to find your next word and that is normal. If you're on Twitter, you can carefully craft the perfect punchline and post it. Uh, if you're writing an email, you can take your time to edit and re-edit, whereas when you're speaking synchronously, when you're in time, in real time, with the people in the room, making eye contact with them, it is much more diff difficult to be articulate, and that's okay. I don't expect you to be perfect. I expect you to be good. So I want you to memorize the outline of your speech. I do not want you to memorize it word for word, right? We're on page 37. I want you um, 
to think about for this first humorous anecdote. What was the first thing that happened? So you've watched my humorous anecdote. Um, uh, so maybe the first thing that we did is um, we got in our different canoes, right? The grown-ups were in one canoe and the kids were in a different canoe. And we floated merrily, merrily down the stream until we came to a bend in the river. And then the canoe flipped, right? And then I lost my jelly sandals and then I went home to grandma. So maybe I have five major points that I want to get through and I can remember that on my hand start with my thumb, then I go to the point of finger, and I'm moving chronologically through this organization pattern that I clearly understand. Whatever your organization pattern may be, um, make sure that you have that much at least memorized. So maybe you're going to talk about the pros and the cons of drilling oil here in the U.S. and exporting it abroad. Maybe you think, okay, it might be a good idea, but there are some downsides, and this is your informative speech. Maybe you think about, okay, I've got three reasons on my left hand and three reasons on my right hand. Three reasons why exporting oil would be good for our economy and three reasons why exporting oil may be hasty and not good in the long term. So that sort of memorizing the outline of your speech or the bulk um, pattern or flow, it will help you to ground you. Right, and if you get confused or you get lost, you just go back and say, okay, what was my second point? Right, and that will help you. We'll talk more in chapter 10 about the organization, um, but the same rules that you've had for your papers still applies. I want you to have some sort of introduction, even if it is once upon a time, right? For your humorous anecdote, you're just gonna start with the beginning of the story. Um, but you want to make sure that there's some zing to the beginning of your story. You always want to start uh, with a hook of some kind, which I'm sure you've been in English classes, you understand that concept that you need to hook your audience, you need to grab their attention. You need to have some main points and then a conclusion. So I'm not going to end my speech as we talked about in the humorous anecdote with, and that's my story, or yep, that's what happened. Right, I want to have a clear, this is the worstest day of my life. Thank you for listening. Right, that is a clear conclusion. So um, I'm sure these concepts are familiar to you because you've had English classes, but always have an introduction, an introduction content and then a conclusion. Do not, for any reason, sit down and just type your speech out. Don't do it. Don't do it. And here, let me tell you why, okay? Because you will end up looking for that exact phrase. You'll end up um, staring up at the ceiling and trying to picture what was the next word I was going to say. Your voice will end up becoming a declamation or a didactic. Reading a speech word for word is something, um, is not the kind of occasion. We're always going to speak extemporaneously, okay? So don't go to the writing center and say, I'm going to write my speech today. No, 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 no. Write your outline, right? Memorize the order of events of your speech, but do not, do not, do not, do not um, write out your speech word for word. And in no circumstance in my class can you read your speech. No, you cannot do it. You will not make an A on that speech if you stand up and read it. In fact, you probably won't even pass your speech if you read it. <coughs> Keep the tone conversational. If you have your face buried in your notes and you're not even making eye contact with us, then your voice will actually reflect that, right? It'll start to sound robotic and didactic. When we're reading, we have a different tone than when we're speaking to somebody naturally. That's one of the reasons it's so important to have a loose organization and a conversational tone with your audience. You're making eye contact with them. By didactic, I just mean that it sounds too rehearsed and too when I was seven, my father worked in the booming oil business, right? It's, it has a tendency to sound monotone and uh, unattached. Some of you will sound sing-songy, you'll get into your story, maybe you have rehearsed it too many times and you sort of get into this lulling and disorient it. Oh, I can't even do that any longer. It's, it's, um, if you walk into a convenience store maybe or a, um, you know, a clothing store, somebody might say, hi, welcome to blank blank. We're so glad you're here today. And they've turned it into a little song, right? And that's because they've had to say that exact script too many times. So try not to sing at people. Try to actually talk to them. This is not musical theater class. 
Make sure that the words you're using are understandable, clear, concise, and to the point. We don't want to speak in vague, vague generalities. If you're going to do your tribute speech on Abraham Lincoln, I don't want you to just say, he was a good guy. I like a Abraham Lincoln. Right? That doesn't, there's no information there. That's not helpful. <laughs> right? Um, but we also want to avoid uh, jargon. Right? We want to avoid words that the common person doesn't understand. This can happen if you're maybe in a mechatronics major and you're trying to explain to the rest of us non-mechatronics major what a mechatronics is, right? Um, the engineering language. Make sure that you dumb down the words that you think the common person wouldn't understand, right? Um, don't assume that we speak your language. This happens with my nursing students too. You want to pay tribute to the human heart and so you start talking about vascular this and uh, blood flow that. Well make sure when you're looking around the audience and you look into people's eyes that you're not getting a blank stare of confusion. And that said, that's always a balance. Some people are going to stay with you and follow you. Some people are never going to catch up. Okay, so I'm not saying that if one person looks confused, you have to back the train up, but if most people look confused, you need to start over again. Include tactile, vivid, and engaging wording, right? So just because you've memorized an outline doesn't mean that you're not still intentional about incorporating certain words that are academically uh, at this level, that are engaging or tactile in some way. We talked about this when we talked about humorous anecdotes, so delivery delivery so if you'll turn over the page to page 40 here first rule is speak louder than you think you need to talk uh, this doesn't apply to me I am a very southern girl and I tend to do in vocal co coaching we call it pushing talking too loud <laughs> um, however many of you when you give your first speech if I can't hear your speech, you're not going to make a good grade on it. So talk louder than you think you need to talk. Use clear, right? I don't want to hear any mumbly, mumble mouth mush. I need to hear clear consonants in the endings of your word. You're not going fishing and hunting. You're going fishing and hunting. Okay? It needs to be resonant. By resonant, I mean that it has yummy vibrations. That not that you're shouting, but it, that it's loud enough and resonates enough. The poster child for resonance is James Earl Jones. He has this um, booming and vibrant voice, right? Dulcet just means that it's musical, that there's a lilt uh, to, uh, to your voice that you're using um, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. Do you see how I'm going through different pitches? Make sure that you are embracing the musicality of your voice. Um, most of you will not have an issue about that and you don't need to overthink it. It'll just be people who are naturally monotone who need to think about being dulcet. Uh, I'm guilty of this one as well. Don't speak too fast right? Um, once again, this is regional. Southerners tend to speak a little bit slower than the average American. Women t spend, tend to speak a little too fast. Uh, my husband will not watch Gilmore Girls with me. He's like, how do you understand what they're saying? They're talking so fast. Um, as always, I feel like a broken record. Make good eye contact and look for audience feedback. Um, gesture naturally and move with intention. Now this first speech you're only going to speak for two minutes so you really don't need to move much at all. I would say the tribute speech also. Um, if you don't want to move you can just stand in the same place and we'll get more to that later. Um, try to avoid fidgeting with your hands. Try to avoid um, uh, using repetitive gestures with your hands. If you can just hold them at your um, belly button height in front of you. Never hold, fold your hands behind you because that is off-putting and feels distancing um, unless you want to be a drill sergeant and alienate your audience, which I don't know. Maybe you got to be the boss. More to come in chapter 13. Okay, so we're through. Um, after you're finished giving your speech, I want you to take a moment um, to think about it what went well, what didn't get well, and then when I hand your feedback back, um, you can kind of compare that. What uh, is how you thought you did 
the same as how you did, according to me. Maybe you thought it was a lot worse, and I gave you an A on the speech, and you're like, wow, I did better than I thought. Or maybe um, you rushed through your speech and said, phew, I got that over with, only to have me say you were rushing through your speech, uh, you didn't genuinely communicate with the audience. So um, take a moment to self-reflect and um, just to review. So if you feel yourself getting tense, the first thing I would recommend that you do is take some deep breaths, right? Send that oxygen to your brain. Do some stretching to get your blood flowing, right? Take some deep breaths so deep that you can imagine that you're sending air down to your groin. If you haven't exercised that day, make sure you go exercise before you come in to give your speech. As you're walking up to the front of the class, take some deep breaths again, right? Be intentional about your breath. Um, stand up tall so that you can get your breath underneath to you. If you're slumped over, then perhaps um, you're not breathing as efficiently as you could. So everybody poops as they say in the children's book and most normal human beings get nervous when they speak publicly so you are in good company remember i'm not asking you to be perfect i'm just asking you to be good thank you for listening <laughs>